Okay, uh, Kyle, Graham, Mark, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to uh, review Q2 uh, or Q1. I keep thinking we're in Q2, uh -huh. but it's almost. Q1 earnings. Uh, almost. Uh, uh, I want to give just a quick warning and disclosure. Uh, anyone who's listening, this is not advice. Please rely on your own due diligence. Um, I am an investor in Glasshouse. I am not compensated by the company. I do not work for the company. Uh, I am wrong uh, occasionally. Uh, so please do not rely on anything that I say and make sure you're doing your own homework and due diligence um, before making any investment decisions. Why we're reviewing Glasshouse is the same reason we've been reviewing it before, is that I find it fascinating that they're you're basically doing something very different, which is try to provide high quality cannabis um, at scale at a very low cost, basically harnessing God's gift to the environment, which is Ventura County, California. Um, and uh, utilizing a unicorn of a greenhouse that allows you to produce at a, at a cost that no one else can touch, but more importantly, a quality, and that you're iterating on that process and we're seeing it every quarter. Um, and so that's why I continue to find uh, what you're doing is fascinating. You're not trying to explore, exploit limited license markets. Uh, you're not depending on charging medical or recreational consumers prices that are three to five X you're competing in the very competitive California market. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's really fascinating. Uh, I want to go right uh, to the questions. I mean, the big elephant in the room, what do you think of the rescheduling news? Wow. Uh, number one, Aaron, thank you for having us on. We love coming on your show after every every. Earnings. My show. I like that. I like that. This is a show. The it's Aaron, Aaron, it's show. Aaron show. Exactly right. <laughs> show. We've been doing this for a couple of years now, it feels like, right? I mean, this is, yes. almost, this yes. is a real tradition at this point. Yeah. So so let me start by saying I saw I saw anger out there on Twitter saying this is not enough. This is people are still going to get locked up and all of that. And you know what? They're 100% right. That said, if you hold out for, I have to have the whole enchilada or I'm not going to eat, I think that's a mistake. And I think the way things work oftentimes politically, it's ugly, it's messy, and this is what I would describe. But look, big and small operators are going to benefit from this. And also, for me, who sits on the board of Mission Green, this makes more of a mockery for those folks that are sitting in prison because now federal government's recognizing it's a schedule three and I don't think they can argue it shouldn't have been the whole time. And so I'll take the incremental all day long. It's going to be good for our customers, the, you know, the smaller players we work with and it'll be good for glass house. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a bandaid on a broken arm, right? So it doesn't fix it. It's not a federal policy solution, but it is progress towards one. And I think to ignore the fact that it's the biggest, uh, shift in the federal level. And basically since they started the racist war on drugs, it would be missing the point, which is it's going to be brick by brick. It's going to be led by the states. And I think our belief is that this on its own helps on a number of fronts, taxes being the most tangible one, but it's also going to be a catalyst for all kinds of things. It's going to, I think it helps catalyze, you know, interstate commerce packs between states, uplistings, changes in custody, all kinds of things are going to get uh, you're going to get the, the fire lit and pushed along by this, even if it doesn't do them directly. And 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 I and you see on my Twitter, I I tear into Joe Biden all the time because he has released nobody from prison. That said, being equal opportunity, as Graham just said, this is you know it is a Best step yet. in the right direction. <laughs> right. And so I have to give a tip of the cap to the Biden administration. It's not what we want, but it's better than where we are. Gotcha. So. You mentioned a bunch of things. The One of the big questions investors have is, does this lead to listing on US exchanges? What are your thoughts? What are you hearing? So so the, the real answer, and I think the only true answer is I don't know. What I can tell you that I do know is conversations are happening. I've heard Boris publicly say, NASDAQ, they're looking at it, things like that. And I can tell you for a fact at the highest levels, of the New York Stock Exchange, we've been told, are also having those conversations. And so, um, 
you know, it'll be interesting to see how they react, but they're anticipating a schedule three and they're going to determine what, what they do. The argument that is being presented is if I go to MSOS, which is listed, I believe on NASDAQ, I can have a basket of, of U S cannabis company stocks that I can own. Why can't I just own those individually? And that's that's the question that's being asked. And I know we could end up debating, but that's what they're they're working through right now. I think there's also a good analogy, Aaron, with banking, right? So similar, the exchange is similar to the banks created a their own self-imposed moratorium, so to speak, on cannabis, right? There was there's no exchange that tried to list it, and the SEC said no, no exchange got uh, fined for listing the cannabis company, just like the banks said you know, we can't list, we can't have a bank account from a cannabis company. Well, nothing's changed. And yet every MSO has a bank account. We've had a bank account for five years. 50% of our customers now have bank accounts. It didn't, nothing shifted. They just got more comfortable with it. So in that vein, if their self-imposed moratorium is you need it off schedule one, then when it goes off of schedule one, it's totally in their wheelhouse to say, okay, it's now fine to do it. And I mean, you can look at IRPR, you can look at weed, you can look at MSOS. There's all kinds of examples of, of all right up to the line as it is. This, I think, probably likely catalyzes some FOMO between those guys. Their business is getting listings. Why wouldn't they want them if they feel like they can do it safely? Who knows? Maybe I'll get off Morgan Stanley's band list and <laughs> investor people who have their own money at Morgan Stanley can send money to my funds. We can all dream. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, banks, you know, one of the things that I think about when I think about Glasshouse is you are just sitting on prime agricultural land and with a state-of-the-art facility that clearly has enormous value, but only has about $60 million of debt on it. And if this was any other industry, you would have 50% debt to equity, 60%, maybe even 70% debt to equity, and you would have a great interest rate. And God help us if this was USDA, right. you would get 3%. some crazy subsidized <laughs> right. yeah. uh, rates. How, do you think that this, when this is done, this helps get that kind of debt financing where you kind of get out of the penalty box? You clearly are not a speculative venture anymore. When we first, when I started saying, hey, everybody, look at what they're doing. This is really special. I mean, you can clearly see uh, and compare and contrast and see what what you and your team and the facility are capable of. A any thoughts on debt financing, on refinancing that and what Schedule 3 will do? So, Aaron, it's, it's interesting because yeah, I know you and I have talked real estate and, you know, I have a, a large real estate company as well. So I do have a kind of a thermometer or a gauge, if you will, on what debt should look like and debt to companies, things like that, where you have no handcuffs. And then we have the cannabis company where you have some handcuffs and some restraints. I would tell you that I don't, I don't know if, if, uh, at the USDA, that that would seemingly be a little bit doubtful to me. That, about, that's a stretch. That's a stretch okay. goal. But what if I'm just talking regular financing, yes. more alternative financiers that could come in? Yes. And, and I would tell you just from what I'm seeing, and, and I have to admit, I'm not I'm not Seth Yakutan that is out there talking to everybody. I'm very focused in on what we do here at Glasshouse as, as our fiduciary. So I can tell you. The options on the table have never been better. And so we're always having discussions. Are they as good as unhandcuffed uh, American business? Probably not uh, or no, but I would say that, that that's refreshing. And a lot of that has to do with not much about schedule three, quite frankly. I think it because the discussions and some of what we were been we've been hearing were predate the schedule three. So as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think that if you are performing, you're showing things for those that are already comfortable in the water, they're getting a little bit more comfortable. And there is a little bit of FOMO as there are some large banks out there that have entered in and are, oh. or are looking to enter in. And um, I think that that's the same. Rescheduling thing. probably makes it easier for them. I think so, because if more people come in and that's the same thing with NASDAQ or, or NYC, if one of them get goes in. The other is going. I just I can't imagine they're going to sit there and watch the entire industry go to one exchange. 
So the same thing I think is what's happening here is people are coming in and they're realizing they better be competitive to build the relationships with the companies that they want to do business with. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, the other big thing that investors focus on is 280E. I know it doesn't affect cultivation so much, but you do have a retail business. You do have a branded business. Maybe this is a question for Mark. Uh, you know, you, I believe if uh, I saw on Twitter that like someone, or you mentioned it on the call that you paid 280E tax so far this year. Uh, it's It seems very clear that this 280E, what this decision even highlighted, that it goes away. Does this mean that are you continuing to pay 280E? Are you going to ask for a refund? Are you... How are you thinking about 280E, you know, because, you know, that $10 million, while not like life altering to, it could help pay for the oh, next greenhouse. Listen, uh, if someone gives me, gives us $10 million, we'll, we'll put it to good use. <laughs> no, uh, I, no, I know. I know. It's, 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 it's important. Um, none of the projections we've given assume uh, 280E goes away, right? So, we're, we're keeping business as usual until we know exactly what's going to happen. The big impact for us, um, since we saw a significant improvement in our profitability, or I'm going to call it our operating profitability in 2023 versus 2022, the impact of 280E in 2022 and earlier is actually relatively small for the company, but I've estimated for 2023, it's about $10 million. So if we file taxes in a way that we disregard the 280 penalty, we'll save $10 million versus what we would currently file. Now, we're our, our practice for filing income, in federal and state income tax, has been to do it late in the year, typically September or October for the prior year, and then pay taxes the actual amount due in December. So as it relates to 2023, we have not paid any federal or state income taxes yet. And we'll do that basically in December of this year. So we're taking a bit of a wait and see approach to see how this develops. And then we can make our call as to how we want to approach the 2023 tax year. Um, gotcha. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of flexibility for 2022 and earlier years. Uh, however, the, however we file for 2023, we will do in such a way that we can go back if we need to, to amend the return. So if we file as though 280E is still on the books, um, we'll make sure we can go back and amend the return and try to claw back that money in the future if it makes sense. But we, we're we monitoring the situation and in some ways, the MSOs that are going at this with the IRS, we're going to watch and see what happens and we have months to make the call. So our approach gives us some flexibility. But again, the difference between what we would, what we will pay under current law, tax law, and assuming 280E goes away would be about $10 million different for 2023. And that continues to grow as we get bigger for 2024 and beyond. So gotcha. it's, it's a significant amount. Or said, said another way, um, that's more than our debt amortization with our credit facility. Right? Yeah. I mean, seven and a half million for the credit facility, 10 million in tax savings. It's not an insignificant amount for yeah. the company. Half, half yeah. a greenhouse. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. I love it. Uh, I wanted, you know, just kind of my last big picture question is something I've been thinking about recently uh, because your company has done so well, because you're outperforming, um, because you have just such inherent advantages in your Camarillo facility. Um, and I'm curious about this and in, 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 in whether how much you've thought about this, but my worry is that you're you're now more of a target than ever for lots of groups who see your advantages and see your outperformance and basically, and I've written about this before, throw rocks at your glass house. Uh, whether it's California operators 
who are struggling, who are looking for someone to blame, or it's MSOs who, I mean, if I was, if I was a large MSO, I would be very worried about interstate commerce. Uh, and I see this, and I'm just curious of how you guys think about this, how you think about operating your business as you now are emerging to be a formidable company. Um, efforts to either counteract it or, you know, from some groups to try to paint you as the bad guy. Uh, I'm just, I'm curious of what your thoughts are. I mean, I'll tell you the, the, the two people, I, the two groups I think about are our consumers, which we're trying to make happy by giving them the best quality cannabis for the best possible price and our shareholders who put their faith in us to deliver on that promise because then that's a virtuous cycle. If you can make things that people love, people love our cannabis, they're buying more of it every day. You can see it in the headset data. You can see that glass house and, and, and all's well together, the most consumed cannabis by volume and the biggest cannabis market on the entire planet. So people love what we're doing. And if we keep doing that, deliver them at a price that's higher, they're willing to pay that's higher than it costs us to make it. That's the definition of a good business that will make our shareholders happy. And if those two groups are happy, I'm happy. So that's my answer. And, 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 you know, Aaron, um, we understand where, as you just said, if I'm competing against you, I'd see you as formidable. I'd see you, you know, I, I wouldn't be happy. And, and so I certainly understand. Um, but I think people need to understand that wherever they are in this whole thing, I can tell you back in 17, 18, when MedMen went public, I had investors, longtime investors in me questioning, hey, how come you're not more like MedMen? How come you're not more like this? And all I said was, I know how to run businesses. I'm a value investor. I watch how we allocate capital. And we had really stuck to just very kind of Ben Graham um, value investing capital allocation. And I would, I would encourage everybody to do that to their best of their ability. Ultimately, a lot of the small growers who I really care most about are the legacy growers in California, because quite frankly, using a baseball analogy, they're Jackie Robinson. We're playing in modern day baseball thanks to them. The appellation that is so sought after is because of them. And so when interstate commerce comes and you take the handcuffs off those growers who dealt with craziness, they're going to kill it. So what we try and do is, and, and I would you know challenge anybody out there to tell me when we have when we have thrown shade or been negative towards other people. Yes, we've been attacked and a couple of times we've attacked back um you know legally but really and truly we're cheering for everybody in a very very tough market and so that's that's where i would say is when people have asked for advice doesn't matter who they are i'm always happy to say this is what i would do and consider it for what it's worth so but when it comes down to the big picture where graham and i have always tried to picture what does a normalized cannabis market look like and i know aaron you and i have talked about this too at some point this is gonna come down to the best possible agriculture. It's like strawberries. 95% of the strawberries come from California. Not because California people are geniuses about growing strawberries. It's because we're in the right climate, the right location for that. And we have the infrastructure set up to go ahead and transport it. So I think that's what's gonna happen here with cannabis. So I think we're set up to do well. Um, and as a large shareholder, and a lot of my family and friends are large shareholders, I, I concur with Graham. Let's just keep doing what we're doing, try and be smart, be prudent, and try and be a positive force in this in industry. Shooting out lawsuits on everybody and yelling at the state of California to enforce more is not the approach that we, we would take because that's going to have some bad outcomes for people. And we don't want that. What we want is to quietly have conversations with the legislators to say, look, two thirds of the market is untaxed. You fully handle gasoline. We don't have any untaxed gasoline out there. You fully have the alcohol beverage control. You handle that and you handle tobacco. So let's be smart and encourage the folks, the legacy folks, lower the barriers to entry, make it easier. It's best for the consumer. Lower the taxes a bit. Let this, let, let this plant and this industry grow. That's what our ask is, because then I think you're going to see it's great for the consumer and it's great for a lot of the folks that have been doing this a long time. Oh, those are great answers. No, thank you so much. Uh, turning to cultivation, 
Graham, you've had some time with the new greenhouse. Uh, I know in past discussions, you say it takes about, uh, you know, like a year, two years to get a green, a new greenhouse uh, up and running. How would you describe the process of turning on your experience just yeah, the new greenhouse? Uh, so we planted, um, we planted greenhouse five in kind of late January. Um, first harvest was mid-March, so we're call it two months in of actually having uh, things coming out of that. The product has now gone through the dry and the cure and sitting the sales team. And I would say uh, we've, we're, we're feeling very, very good about it. It's uh, as, as I guess you would expect to some degree, right? This is we've, the second time uh, you, you should improve. So we've taken the learnings not only of the last eight years in Glasshouse, but in the last two years specifically at our uh, SoCal farm in Camarillo and uh, made a number of changes in the Greenhouse 5. And I think we're, we're happy about all of those uh, changes. So you know, I think Greenhouse 5 is surely the best greenhouse that we have uh, brought online to date. And uh, it's still pretty early in the operations. If anybody has a, uh, a, a sunshine dance, they're welcome to do it. We've had a pretty uh, cloudy uh, month here in, uh, in Southern California. So we're looking forward to the, uh, uh, to the sun. But again, this is a place where Greenhouse 5 is better set up to deal with us than Greenhouse 6 was. So you know, we're getting to test out some of the new tools that we have. And so far, I think across the board, our metrics for five are, are meeting or exceeding the initial targets that we had for it. So in all, all in all, no, nothing but good, good things to say about five so far. That's great. You mentioned on the call that you're seeing a bit more trim in the product mix, and that's affected your average selling price. Can you just briefly explain why sure. that? Yeah, and, the case and how it may change. Yeah, and I, I want to preface it by saying this: this is not that's not a negative, right? It would be a negative if we were saying we were trading flour for trim, but that's not what we're saying. We're seeing we're getting more more flour, more smalls, and more trim, just not necessarily by equal portion, right? So to, to make up numbers, say we got five percent more flour, but we got ten percent more trim. We have more of everything. It's just got as it. a percentage of that bigger pie, the trim is, has increased slightly. So it, there, there's not a negative in there. Um, I think it's, it's partially uh, process changes. And, and really, again, don't forget that even though in California, trim is the lowest value product, at, you know, call it 30-ish dollars a pound. Um, there's also higher grade trim that can sell for $75 a pound here. And if you go to other markets, literally every other market, even Oregon has $100 a pound trim. Colorado has $150 a pound trim. You can go crazy in Alaska and it's $700 a pound for trim, right? So this is not a valueless category. Through our operations, we've been able to make sure that more of this category of the product makes it into something we can sell instead of ending up in the trash. And so it's really the team doing a good job of saying, hey, there's value here. How can we be more efficient at capturing it? And again, I know it's not today. No, it's not in our models, but eventually the walls do come down. I don't think there's any question about the if of interstate commerce. We don't do it in any other product. We're not going to do it here. When that happens, the next lowest state would bring our trim from $30 a pound to $100 a pound, that extra incremental $70 is 100% pure bottom line profit. So making sure that we capture the trim uh, is, a, is a positive, not a negative, particularly as long, or I said specifically as long as we're capturing more flour and smalls at the same time. Oh, well, that's great. And how has the market responded to the, the extra uh, flour trim smalls you're producing do you have any trouble selling it? How is pricing? Can you give a brief overview of just yeah, sure. market impacts? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think, you know, we mentioned before that we had customers basically on allocation. So people were asking for 500 pounds and we were telling them they could only have 300 because or else we would have uh, run out before we got around to everybody uh, in kind of implied within that is that we were also somewhat limited in going out and finding new relationships with new customers because we already had existing customers that we couldn't fully fully service. So as this volume hits, we've now been able to do a better job of filling the orders that people want. And it also allows the sales team to uh, in increase their prospecting for new things. Um, as I, I know, uh, you know, if you look at the overall supply demand balance um, of the market, uh, there hasn't really been any demand destruction. So demand is staying fairly constant while there is significant attrition and reduction in the supply side. So what we're doing with our new square footage is really just 
backfilling a small piece of what has left from the market overall. So I think, you know, right now the sales team is happy. They're happy they got supply. Our consumers who are getting, you know, half filled orders are happy they're getting full filled orders. Um, we're going to head into the second half of the year, which seasonally is a bit softer on supply. But I think so far we're just seeing the, I'll call it the normal seasonality and not really seeing gotcha. a particular impact from the volume that we're bringing. Because I, again, I think we're just backfilling uh other suppliers who have left the market. So I think net net. Well, no, I just posted on Twitter today that just in the last week, 2 million square feet left the market again. We're back to Q3 of 2020 uh, levels and over 26 million square feet of cultivation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, cultivation it's, it's, has left the market. The thing it can even kind of blows my mind, but I think it's important to keep in mind is there is significantly less cultivation in California today than there was before we opened up our SoCal farm. So with everything they add, that's that's in your numbers, right? Our new license yeah, yeah, that's right. in your numbers. And still it is millions and millions of square feet less cultivation than when we started this project. So net yeah. network is back filling some of a piece of what's leaving. Graham, if I go back to Q1 of 2022, you had a bit of an issue with aged inventory and like not the right balance of strains. You and your team have done a fantastic job in the last couple of years that that's not an issue. You're increasing your output. I'm just curious of how you think about, is this anything that I should worry about? You feel like you're on it in terms of you're producing a tremendous amount of cannabis. And I know that being strained is really important, having the right strains. Let, let me just comment real quick on that. In fairness to Graham, because I remember when that decision, it was, I think this is the Cherry AK issue, Graham. Yeah, probably. I think so. That's, that's like right. we could not keep it in. Like people were paying premiums for Cherry AK, so we're like, let's get more. And guess what? <laughs> then all of a sudden, we're like, hey, you want some Cherry AK? And they're like, hello, hello. So <laughs> uh, uh, I, we learned a very valuable Cherry lesson. Graham, go ahead. Yeah, I yeah. Just um, you know, can cannabis is real is interesting. Uh, my analogy is fast fashion, which is where there's some things that are timeless, but there's also a lot of stuff in the market that turns over quickly and there's a premium on new and their premium on variety. So we've put a lot of effort into improving our strain, strain planning, doing more and more R and D as we've got larger, it's allowed us to dedicate more resources. I mean, half of one of our greenhouses at our first farm is now just for research and development on new strains. So, you know, we've been something that was a big piece of our world when we started is now something that we're using to feed the really big piece of our world. And um, the sales teams and the operations teams have done a great job working together on that. Um, and, and I think Greenhouse 5 is actually a positive from that point of view, because one of the things it does is it allows us to increase the variety, right? So I think there's probably some embedded upside because we started five so early on the in our in our, in our target window, some of the initial stuff that was planted in there was kind of what we already had. And, you know, we, it's, it's what was available from our existing catalog. Whereas now we're getting into kind of the planted timing, which means that we had the new strains to fill the new area as part of, of the plan. So five allows us to add more variety and make sure that we're not overloading on any one strain and actually expand our menu, which uh, makes the sales guys happy. Aaron, one other one other quick point. Since since that happened, uh, we've we've put in processes in both CPG and in wholesale. We 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 watch our inventory very closely. So if we see a place where we're out of balance or we don't like what's going on in the market, we move on it pretty quickly. And going back to Graham's fast fashion analogy and having spent eight years in in the world of fashion, surprisingly. Um, your first markdown is usually your best. Mark, don't uh, be embarrassed about your runway markdown. I, I can, I can tell from don't. your shirt that you were in the fast fashion industry, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, I mean, we, we watch our inventory closely, and if we don't like the velocity at which something is moving, uh, we, 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 we will do what we need to to prevent it from getting to be too old. Because if you do, that's when you really lose value. So it's better to take, make the decision and move quickly than to let it age and hope you're going to get the price you wanted. And we've gotten much better at doing that. Well, yeah. great. Thank you for that. And anyone who's listening, when I just send the audio recording, 
Uh, Mark is wearing like a Hawaiian shirt celebrating Asian Pacific Islander day wow. they just had. So it was just a inside joke if you can't see him. Um, <laughs> uh, on the call, you mentioned you have opportunities to spend some CapEx to upgrade five and six to improve yields. Um, can you give a little more color of when that may happen? Because last time when you especially you did your drying and storage, suddenly last year you saw this huge bump. Is it something like that in terms of production? Like, please give it, give a little more details of what you meant by that. Yeah, sure. Um, I would look at it in the context of what's the next leg for us in terms of a, expanding our production, right? So there's a, there's a number of different ways we can do that. We've mentioned, I think, greenhouse two, and you know, or just adding another greenhouse. There's a spectrum of you know, you could go all the way from rebuilding a greenhouse purpose built from scratch, retrofitting a greenhouse like we've done in the past, doing a minimum viable greenhouse while to bring on more production with a minimum amount of capital, given the cost of capital and potential maybe changes. And then the another path is that you could upgrade existing greenhouses to produce more. Um, there's a range of things that you could do in there as well. Uh, we like a number of the changes we made in greenhouse five, so we could back uh, you know, backport those to greenhouse six. There's also things like supplemental lights and being able to uh, add to what mother nature already gives us. So we're currently going through the evaluation on all those. And now that five is online and rolling well, uh, we're thinking about, you know, what happens next. Um, obviously schedule three doesn't inherently mean interstate commerce, but as we talked about, do think uh, that it provides further push and a schedule, uh, you know, a catalyst for, for things to evolve, whether that means interstate commerce with states, uh, California, Oregon, Washington, all have laws in the book, Arizona, a neighboring state with a one and a half billion dollar markets got one in committee, New Jersey, where weed costs $75 an eighth, uh, you could get 10 all's well eights for the same price. And people are talking more and more about what that means for particularly patients over there. Um, and that they, you know, this is medicine for many and should they have to pay 10 times what somebody in California pays, that all is solved with interstate commerce. So, uh, or whether it's somebody in DC recognizing that 280E was a hundred billion dollar or whatever the number is cash cow and schedule three takes that away. What's the solution? Maybe it's federal legalization um, and some sort of excise tax. All those things are factored in now to like, you know, from again, I, as we've said, I think the SoCal farm goes from feeling big to all of a sudden very small when the national market that we believe will show up eventually does. Is it safe to say that in terms of these CapEx projects are turning on the next greenhouse, that it's kind of like stay tuned, that you guys will let us know. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, I think on on past, it, per, kind of past performance is likely a good indicator for future, which is we try really hard to be good capital allocators that generate, you know, great returns on capital. And we're evaluating, you know, all the options on how to do that next is the best that we've ever done it yet. I think, Aaron, the way to look at it is exactly that. And that is, we have a lot of options to increase our uh, production. And, you know, we've watched our stock tick up. But if if we're of the mind that our stock will continue to go up as we continue to hit milestones. So what is the best, what's the cheapest way or what's the best way to get a cash on cash mm -hmm. return for the least amount of money? To continue to push that, and I think if if we're um, following in footsteps of, of very smart capital allocators, that's the, that's the way you have to look at it. At the same time, you have to check market conditions just to see because you know we brought on a whole lot of of cannabis, so our entire team and hats off to the grow team, hats off to the processing team, hats off to the sales team. They're they're moving a lot, so we're we're monitoring you know sort of the uh, the dashboard and the cockpit just to make sure everything's good. At the same time, we have our calculator and spreadsheets out. So I would tell you Got that it. this is this is a prior, priority in our company. Got it. Uh, turning to CPG, one of the best news for me is that we suddenly see a turnaround. I have every quarter, I'm like, why are you in CPG? Why are you? And you made the very compelling pitch that was like, hey, what went on in cultivation is going on in CPG. It's going to be worth it. We, after several painful quarters, we saw a good increase in gross profit, all's well brand, obviously being the star. How should I expect? Is this, are we going to keep going or how, how would you have us think? How would you have investors think about CPG um, 
So right yeah, now. Here, here's how I look at it. Number one, you are not the only person to call it out, but you always do it loudly <laughs> with a smile on your face. So it resonates and it sticks in our head. Uh, and your call outs were not wrong. Like we, we, we didn't have a good argument, except this is where we thought things could go. And I want to, I want to point out that, yes, we're very happy. That's our CPG, our sales director and CPG team have done a brilliant job. And let me tell you the handcuffs that we put on them and including me specifically by taking some of our top salespeople out on walks with me to go, guys, forget PDSA, forget headset. They only measure sales. I, we as a company only care about sales in which we get paid because it's almost like having yes. a park building and going, it's full, but nobody's paying. That's the road to bankruptcy. So we, um, we were very diligent about that. And um, Mark hired somebody he worked for to head up our credit who had experience with two other ca California cannabis in companies. So he really knew what he was doing, knew all the players and we try and be fair with all of our retailers, but right now, California retail, it's in a period of big distress. We know it because we're also vertically integrated. So we see what's happening with our neighbors. And so, um, and at the same time we dropped field, which is a brand emotionally, I really like, but the bottom line is the numbers just didn't show. So like a good coach, sometimes you got to sit your favorite player down because just not hitting the, he's not hitting it and also forbidden flowers. So we focused in on what was really working, leaned into it. Also, sometimes less is more. And um, I, I'm encouraged by the results. And if we continue to pick up uh, retail and management, things like that, um, I think you're going to see continued climb in that CPG sector. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that makes me uh, optimistic is, is I think we've always said long, long term, the goal is not to ship grapes across the country. The goal is to ship bottles of wine with the, you know, the California label and the glass house and the all is well on it. Like that's truly, we want to have everything that we grow end up in a, in a product that lands in consumers' hands directly um, is to see the progress that we could make with focusing on it and to see the way that we could use our vertical integration to really build that margin and all the way from kind of like Apple does with an iPhone, right? It's like they make the iPhone, but they also make the chips and they make the software and they make the camera lenses. And so when they want to do something, they can talk with the, all the connecting departments that allow them to do things in a way that not no one else really can. And, and to keep in mind that the winds haven't even shifted, right? So this is the progress we're making while going uphill with the wind blowing 30 miles an hour in our face. As Kyle you know, mentioned, like our teams, there's, there's 1,200 stores in California. There's probably you know, 400 that are actually paying their bills and we're still making this progress. With before schedule schedule three, before 280E goes away, still no credit cards, right? And with pedaling the bike with the brake stuck on, their team is still making progress. And so as that starts to change, the work that they're doing, their legs are going to be strengthened from that. And I think they'll really we'll really be able to take off when some of those barriers fall away and the winds shift a bit more. And, and I have to think that it, the 280E going away is like a massive boon to retailers. Yes. This should be a very good thing for anyone selling to retailers. So I've got to think that, especially when this is official, this could be really positive. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think most, most people would also talk retail. about, you know, uh, taking credit cards being good for a thirty-plus percent revenue boost, right? Like, I mean, at the end of the day, I think. Well, if I, if I, you think it leads to that, you think we get credit cards? I, I, if, the, if banks are banking and exchanges are potentially listing, I'm not sure. Again, so the, that would the, be a the, huge boom. The most tangible yeah. thing that I've heard, again, this tea leaves and you know, crystal balls made out of salt uh, kind of stuff is that on Schedule One, financial institutions are concerned that what it, participating is aiding and abetting. If it goes to Schedule Three, it's no longer a, you know, strictly federally illegal, and that some of those, those concerns abate. Now, I would personally counter that with. So the banks who are all banking it, I mean, you know, every, like I said, every MSO has got a bank. Most of our customers now have, have banks. So there's a lot of banking going on. Nothing has changed on the federal level. So again, remind me what the, what the, what the real hurdle was. It was a hurdle in people's minds, but I, I just, I can't see, it's what these guys want to do, right? Like they make money by putting through yeah. transactions. So at some level it's a, everyone else is doing it. We're going to give it a shot. And I'm sure it'll start with, 
somebody doing it for 5% and then it'll be 4% and then it'll be the two and a half percent that it is at the corner liquor store, but uh, it's coming at some point. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great. I uh, want to um, get some finance questions in um, uh, for Mark. Uh, last, uh, last year, you did a great job with working capital. It contributed working capital in over 10 million this year, you mentioned that there it's a bit of a drag, obviously, because you're growing, right? right. Um, and I'm I'm just curious of like, does that mean that outside of working capital, your operational cash flow would have been would be higher if we yeah. just kind of normalize it because yeah, so, you're you're seeing this big increase? Yeah. So I would, you know, I'd look at twenty uh, last year, twenty twenty three. Operating cash flow and adjusted EBITDA were very close together um, because we had the full year, you know, um, Greenhouse 6 was in production at the end of the year. So the working capital remained relatively consistent during the year. So without, without the, I'm going to call it the growth happening or the adding the greenhouse in the middle of the year, I would expect operating cash flow and adjusted EBITDA to, to be very close in a normal, in a normal year. So most of the difference is driven off of the just the ramp up in the working capital needed to to get greenhouse five into full production. Got it. And then, uh, how do you think investors should model the gro gross profit from the wholesale biomass? Um, usually, you multiply the profit per pound, the number of pounds. The final number is usually close. Yeah. Is that so? That's, do you have any thoughts that's on still that? That's still going to, I'm going to say that's still the best way to think about us on a long-term basis. So again, when we say our target is $100 cost of production, and if you say average selling price continues to be low $300, we sh our goal and where we should eventually be is a mid 60 plus percent gross margin business in wholesale, right? Once we get down to that $100. Last year, our cost of production was $136. And if you look at, do the same calculation, looking at our cost of sales and what we sold, it was $140, right? So they're very close together over a 12 month period. We can have some fluctuations due to Got it. timing and what ends up going into our CPG business. The same dynamic should happen this year. So, you know, we've got, I'm gonna call it flat guidance on cost of production. And the best way to think about the cost of sales is going to be, I'm going to call it probably a similar delta, maybe a couple dollars higher. Um, but longer term, they'll be the same. And I, I'm, I fully believe we should be a mid 60 margin, maybe higher business when we get to the end game here in our wholesale business. Gotcha. That's great. Um, is there anything you guys are hearing on interstate commerce in particular? Uh, I, I, I would imagine now that there's schedule three, that this is an opportunity for especially California or some of the other producer states to kind of step up and say, Hey, there's an opportunity here. I'm just curious if you're, because it means so much to your financial model, you know, we all agree on where we will be. I'm just wondering, are you hearing anything or is there anything that you guys are pressing on or anything you could share just in terms of opening up interstate commerce? You know, I want to make sure we're clear. Nothing in our financial model has interstate commerce in it. We know it's coming. We just don't take the time to model it because we think that's just not a good use of our time. Um, and it creates ridiculously large numbers. There, <laughs> as I've done it. <laughs> and, and, and what we tell investors is, look, we know it's going to happen. Look at wine. Look at, look at everything. This, this will not be the only thing that remains this way. Can't give you, and even today, can't give any time. Um, what I would tell you is we're the free call option for that happening because it's hard to picture us not feasting with after this knife fight with the rest of the country. So, um, and maybe the world. Um, I would say that it'll be interesting. That's another thing to watch after schedule three is finished is to see does that now make it where Massachusetts, and if we get a few loud voices, uh, Graham and I just spoke to a reporter who lives in Boston today, and he was saying, 
how he wanted to talk to us about solar. And he was like, and I said, look at the state you're in when you go buy cannabis, how it's made and what it's doing to the environment. Even if you're not a Green New Deal person, still not good. It's not a good use of precious resources with all the electric cars and crypto and AI. We don't need to be growing plants where they don't want to be grown. So, um, so to better answer your question, nothing new on that front, but it does open up some questions after Schedule 3 for sure. Gotcha. And I'm hoping at least the, the next big step will be a Garland memo. There has to be an updated memo for how you deal with this new reclassification. And it'll be really interesting if there's any language related to either interstate commerce packs or things like that. So that's just my own thoughts. You know, I was I looking, Ky yeah, I was looking, Kyle, through, I had to pull up some old information and I was just checking things. And you know, January of 2021, there is a press release where you were, I believe you were fighting for Parker Coleman. Um, and I was like, oh my God, Kyle's been working on this for a while. Uh, and it's, you know, three and a half years from that, uh, kind of my final question every time we talk is to give us an update on prison reform efforts. We get this big schedule three, uh, announcement. Uh, can you give us some update or just your thoughts on where we are? And in particular, this is a question about nonviolent, um, uh, prisoners who were put in jail because of cannabis. Yeah. So number one, thank you for asking me that question. I, I really appreciate it. And, and I always make it a point to, to say if there is time in any interview or any any call, please let me bring this up. I feel like it's a moral imperative. I'm wondering if that 2021 was a uh, was the open letter I wrote to President Trump. Um, and it was about Parker Coleman re you know, requesting his release because I knew from Weldon he was reviewing um, a number, and and he he uh, let out Harry O, who is the real founder of Death Row Records, and which is why if you see Snoop Dogg and um, Dr. Dre that they don't reject Donald Trump, it's because they appreciate what he did. He actually let him out of prison. So, um, but I would tell you that is one of my biggest personal failures is that I have not found a way to move a needle, and I to move the needle to get the president to simply just take out his pardon pen. I mean. I know people sometimes uh, clap back at me on Twitter and they'll read some press release from the DEA or the U.S. Attorney's Office on uh, Parker and say, oh, there was a gun in a car and a da 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 I'm like, look, I actually took the time to read the case file before I got it. I wanted to make sure it was a nonviolent situation. It is. Um, I, talk, I communicate with Parker on a regular basis. I've met, I've been to his parents' home in North Carolina. I've gotten to know them. I still talk to them. And it is one of those things that it's it's a it's a, a paramount importance to me. And I just am so frustrated. And since then, now we add Jose Valero Jr. or Ali or Jerry Heyman. So the list is getting longer. My core links, which is which is the system in which you send emails and receive emails from federal prisoners, just gets a little bit more onerous because these folks are still in there. And all of them are nonviolent cannabis. And because you were asked about Schedule 3 and interstate commerce and, hey, what's the best way to grow more marijuana? All these things, when you put it in context with folks that are serving long prison sentence, Parker Coleman's got a life sentence for the same plant that is still Schedule 1 as we sit here and talk today, as it was then. It's... It's utterly ridiculous. And while I gave a tip of the cap to President Biden for the Schedule 3 announcement, I did see that uh, Ms. Jean-Pierre yesterday made a thing about, made comments about how much he's done for people for simple possession. Okay, it's great. If you're good with people having simple possession, how do you think they got it? So you can't, and you didn't let any of those people out because there were none in there. You solved a problem that didn't exist. Now, again, clearing the records of them, hey, bueno, bueno. But uh, we need to do more. We need to ask people. It's It would be an act of charity just to take a few minutes and either call the White House or email the White House and say, President Biden, take out your pardon pen and pardon all of the federal nonviolent cannabis prisoners, period. 
that'd be my ask. And, and that's how I spend a decent amount of my time and some of my money. The scorecard is how many people did you let out of a cage? And so far that still stands at zero. Well, hopefully this is the beginning. Uh, they're we, making I, a big, oh, they're making a, a big, yeah, I, we can hope, but I appreciate your efforts. Thank you guys. This has been great as usual. Keep up the great work. Um, and can we, can uh, we, can we put it. in one, one last thing real quick. Remember our investor, um, our oh. investor oh. session is coming up June 21st. I so may please. actually be able to make it. Yes. <laughs> So just wanted to make sure your listeners are aware of that. Um, uh, if I, you're if, anywhere near, or you're an investor, you can make it out. One of the great privileges, and I'm really grateful to all of you guys, but especially Graham, for always making time for me, my own investors, or anyone who's interested. It has been absolutely amazing <laughs> watching the progress and literally like the brick by brick, very rare in investing or public markets, can you watch the progress of something? And it has been an absolute joy. So thank you for that. And and, and you should come to the investor session just to be able to see it. Thank cool. you, Aaron. Really appreciate you as always. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it.